What's going on ladies and gentlemen, this is Muscle and this is another Two Line Music Huts Entertainment Report podcast. And tonight we have a real special guest in the building. Listen, this is a Grammy winning producer. Listen, he produced tracks for Rihanna, Drake, Bruno Mars, you name it, he's done it. Listen, you know we have in the building tonight, we have Super Dopes from the Black Chinese in the building tonight. What's going on, Big Boss? Wagwan, Muscle Wagwan. How is everything, Boss? Everything is great. Thank you so very much for actually joining me on the show tonight. Yeah, man. Well, you know, um, it's it's been a long time in the making. Haven't seen you in a while. So um, oh, wow. <laughs> when you reached out to me, I'm just like, you know what? Let me give Muscle a little blessings. You know what I mean? Thank you. And you know, the funny thing, it was a long time ago, we've been in the business now professionally about 25 years, but it was when I was probably in my 15, 16 years, somebody turned to me and said, listen, it's about the relationships that you keep is what's going to carry you to that level, wherever you're trying to go next. You have to keep the relationships and foster them. Absolutely. Relationships is is the most important thing. Um, it's all about keeping your face clean and always just doing good. Um, the people that are like greedy or, you know what I mean, contentious and stuff like that, they normally like place themselves out of the business. Or it's not just music business, it's just business in general. You just have to be a good person. Yeah, you know, you know what, I mean? what? You're hundred percent true because again, remember, I met you in 1999. All right, yes. we're now in 2020. <laughs> That's 21 years later, bro. 21. Wow. You know, it's so crazy. Um, when we met, um, we met at a dance. It had oh, King Turbo. It had which other sound? Diplomat. It was King Turbo, so, Diplomat, Desert Storm, Magnum yeah. Force. Poison dart. Yeah, that's why. Uh, you, you know what was crazy? That was like one of the first dates them that I played for Poison Dart, and that was a very welcoming surprise. Yeah. And, <laughs> and and normally, I mean, I'm, I've met probably thousands of people over the past twenty one years, and yeah. I would say what stuck out to me why I remembered you mm-hmm. mainly is because <laughs> that that event that was held yeah. at the, some firefighters um, banquet hall. Mm-hmm. It, I, I remember me at the front page of the newspaper it was in yeah. Scarborough. <laughs> and I think that at the time they said it's found over 70 shells on the floor. Yeah. So that party got so shut up. I remember um, when the gunfiring was happening and then everybody was on the floor. Crazy. And I remember um, I, I was so scared, like I had some dubs on me in my book bag <laughs> and it fell out. And then after I see, Bobby gave me his passport. Yeah. Bobby okay. Chin from Black yeah. China. And um, and then after, right in the midst of the gunshot, all I remember is I just took up, I said, Bobby, here is your passport. <laughs> 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 Bobby was just looking at me crazy. <laughs> but through, yeah. through that time, some of the figures there, I just never forgot. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? You 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 were one of them. Because mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. you put your, your pedal in the cassettes and stuff like that. Um. And we were we were pretty much we were kids at the time, basically. Mm-hmm. Of course, this is we're talking twenty one years ago, mm-hmm. and it's still just amazing that we're still actually in a business that we love so much. Mm-hmm. Change change a bit from where we first started, but we're still in it, and that's what makes it amazing. Amazing, yeah, no, for real. Well, well, it's, it's about growth, you know. At the end of the day, um, I wouldn't think that. 21 years ago, we'd be do, egg, doing exactly the same right. thing. <laughs> It'd have a switch up a little, remix a little, you know what I mean? Yeah. Life changes. Mm-hmm. No, you understand 100%. Let's take this story right back to the beginning for the audience so they can really understand where Mr. Sopa Dopes is coming from, all right? Because I know originally you were, in, you were born in Jamaica and then mm-hmm. you moved to the States, all right? Well, I was, I was born in Jamaica, yeah. moved to Canada. Yes, and then the the winter hit, and my mother is like, no, eh, eh, up here too cold, and she went to Miami. I had no idea. What part of Canada you guys came to? Um, I, I don't even remember. Probably Scarborough. Yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're all Jamaicans <laughs> are up here at that time. Yeah. You, you remember that um, back in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, um, Canada was underpopulated at the time, so they they opened up their borders to whoever wanted to come, just come, and and yeah. they they gave them residency. Hence, probably that's the reason why you're in Canada. Yeah, you know what I mean. Sure. Where you so you were born in Canada. Yeah, I was born, but my parents came up, so then we were part of that whole seventies, eighties type of trend there. 
where there was a big uh, migration to Canada. And, and you know, the reason for that migration as well, um, in, in Jamaica, Jamaica had a lot of prosperity, especially even after um, 1962 when they got their independence. Okay. But then, um, then, you know, government and stuff took over. And then um, Michael Manley was in power at the time. Mm-hmm. And he was thinking about, he was for the poor people and thinking about taking Jamaica communists. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's why, that's why a lot of people left, especially like, I, I think most of the Chinese Jamaicans went to Canada, believe it yeah. or not. <laughs> 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 there's still, there's still a lot there. Yeah. 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 Cause my wife is a Chin and she's um, originally from Trelawney. Her, okay. her family. So yeah, so definitely I know that. I mean, okay, so then it was Jamaica. How old were you when you left Jamaica? Um, I was two. I was two years okay, old. Okay, so then Jamaica is, is us. That's not even really part of the Superdope saga. It's just no. that's where you were born. Well, I was born there and then I moved back twice. Um, But I, I would say I spent probably less than five years of my life in Jamaica, even yeah. though I can't even twang properly like you know what i mean <laughs> talk like an american or canadian i can't I, you, you, it's like i can't believe that i'm actually raised here but yeah. if i'm trying to talk to you in american you yeah. can't hear my patois <laughs> like it's, it's just crazy one of, one of those things there yeah. oh, well i have i have um, a mother that is a very jamaican and it's like she come from country and I just think that her Jamaicanness is so strong that I just grew up with it, you know? Yeah, it's the influence. Whatever you see at home is what influences you the most, and then you go on the road and you figure it out. But whatever you see in your house is what influences you the most with what's going on there. Absolutely. Um, so, okay, so then you guys went to Canada, then you went to the States. When did you discover that you really liked music at first? Not even wanted to do anything. When you discovered that you actually liked music? Um, I think... Um, I was told that as young as before I could talk, like mm-hmm. a few months, um, and I guess Staying Alive, Staying Alive was the popular song at the time. Yeah. Um, and they told me that I was like, before I could speak, I was even singing along to it saying, ah, 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 yeah. ah. So <laughs> I think I was just born with the love of it. And then um, my mom was always working because my, my dad had like a supermarket back then and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And um, so she was always working. So my aunt raised me and my aunt, I would say, um, basically gave me my love of music because she loved music, but she used to play a lot of like country. So I grew up with a lot of country music in my life. So Kenny Rogers, Dolly yes. Parton, mm-hmm. um, Anne Murray, which is also Canadian. Yeah. Um, so I remember that from my, from my younger days and, and, uh, you know, everybody in the 70s, the disco age, so I grew up with a lot of that. I, d- I don't know if I actually really f- knew about reggae, reggae like that until I was much older. Okay, so it's you didn't really hear reggae per se in your house. You had to basically go out and seek that out. Exactly. Well, I'm talking, you know, in, in, in just like with, with certain relatives and stuff, I will, I will know about the Bob Marley and stuff like that, but it wasn't, that wasn't like my aunt's favorite. That, that's the one that, the aunt that raised me since I was like, toddler coming up you know what i mean yeah crazy crazy okay so then there you that's where you discover you like music and what did you want to be growing up as a kid um i actually wanted to be a singer believe it a or not singer a singer uh, okay and that's something that i actually tried to pursue at one point <laughs> <laughs> i no idea but but uh, and i actually can sing you know what i mean not not i don't even know if i can sing well anymore because I, that just have not been in practice for many years but mm-hmm. um i actually wanted to be a singer i had no idea and what type uh-huh. of music um just I, I was just a, a lover of music you know what i mean in general just 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 whatever i heard you know mm-hmm. like um whatever was popular at the time i remember listening to phil collins lionel richie um things like stylistics mm-hmm. spinners so it, it, it's pretty diverse you know what i mean wham madonna this michael is, jackson this is uh, from mid 70s to mid 80s type of thing that's, exactly that's exactly. what My, miami vice days um a lot of the music influenced me then and then um mm-hmm. and like i would say in the mid 80s that's when um that's when hip-hop started to emerge mm-hmm. as like um like that's when hip-hop really started to get popular like with the like run dmc and all those early forefathers. You, mm. you would hear a couple of things about them. Like, you know, remember they had the rapper's delight and yeah, cool Modi, cool Modi. Well, and, but and that was much, that was like after, you know what yeah. I'm saying? 
Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, cool more the fat boys. In fact, I actually know one of them. Um, he used to, he was on the radio station here. Um, okay. Prince Marquis, the Puerto Rican yes. one. Yes. Uh, okay. I haven't seen him in years, though. Yeah, that's crazy. They're so singer. So when do you decide, say, OK, you know what? You don't really want to pursue singing. You basically want to start playing music opposed to actually singing it. Well, how, how I even got into, like, say, playing music, you know, is my brother's, um, uh, I'm, I'm the baby out of 12. My, my, my dad was a gangster. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Clearly. So five, five baby mamas. Um, yeah. And definitely, um, I was the baby. So I, I was the last one. So my brothers are much older than me. So okay. they started a, a DJ shop where um, they actually like sold like DJ equipment and built equipment and stuff like that. And they, okay. they were DJs themselves. So they had, um, they used to hold their parties back in the early 80s in Miami, Cosmic Force. And I actually grew up seeing that. And I think that is what led me to ultimately want to be a DJ. And then when I was a kid, I used to go around the shop and help out and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and then I started DJing from a very young age. Like um, I, I made it on the radio station, the biggest radio station here at the time, which is still exists today. Um, Power 96 when I was like 13, 14. Wow. But I started DJing even before that. Or, okay. or, yeah. And did you actually know somebody at the station or was you sent in a demo? My, or how did you get to the station? Well, my brother knew somebody named Phil Jones. He's also Jamaican, but he's very Americanized. I think he was, like, came from New York down there, like back in the 80s. And um, he worked there. And um, my brother's like, yo, put my little brother on there, which that's kind of crazy. He's like, oh, can you? <laughs> if I know it's like you have your radio station when you, you yeah. look at the person and say, yo, put my 13 or 14 year old brother on the station. You will, you'll be like, um, no. <laughs> and so I, I went on the radio station now and um, mm-hmm. I impressed them and I ended up staying on there into my adulthood like so basically when when i met you was around that time that i left it okay so you're talking this is from like 1990 all the way up until 99 crazy that yeah. is crazy so you went in they like your style and what type of music were you actually playing on the radio at that um I, I, the first time um i went on there i played um mostly reggae but um I loved hip hop more than anything else. So I would even more recommend, uh, like I said, I was more of a hip hop DJ than even just reggae. And then um, then in the early 90s, you had an influx of like, the influence of like reggae hip hop, like that was popularized like by Salam Remy. Yeah. And then you remember like Daddy Freddy and and then you, you're talking these songs like um, the Mad Lion or Keres one yes. used to always touch with the BDP movement because you always dabbled in the reggae, but then, think he produced like Mad Lion now, you know, gotta take it easy. Too many suckers, I had enough time. <laughs> yes. And then yeah, you had um, the Ghetto Red Hot, which produced by Bobby Condas. And um, and then, um, well, the remix was um, basically produced by Bobby Condas and Salam Remy, which Salam Remy, he commissioned Salam Remy to make it. And um, right, yeah. that was a massive hit. Then you that had like- Super Cat you're talking about. Super Cat, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, so back some of them rally back. Um, then you just had like a lot of things that influenced me. And then I'm like, oh, cool. That is so amazing. Um, how hip hop and reggae match up. And, um, that was really more or less my influence, which you hear in my CDs much later on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Crazy, so crazy. But I, I, but in the midst of all of that, um, I started like dabbling into producing when I was like 16, 17. Um, my brother also built a studio and, um, just for fun, we'll just be in there and um, we'll just like me and my cousin, which my cousin lives in Canada, is called, um, is, uh, call him Teddy. Okay. Um, he lives in Canada now, but this was when he used to live down here. So he and I would start to mess around with the drum machine and, and then because we wanted to be a group. So he was the rapper, I was the singer. And, okay. And then at first I used to try to like, um, I, I, cause I knew a couple guys that made beats, you know what I mean? And we wanted to sing, but nobody took us seriously. So my brother had the drum machine. So we went in the studio and I started to make my own beats and that's how I started producing. Okay. And what type of beats was it? Your, what style of beats were you making at this? Time? Um, it, it was, it was like reggae hip hop. It was like more, it was more like, um, reggae hip hop. Mm-hmm. 
um, basically like reggae samples with hip hop drums. It was a bit, bit more reminiscent to like Born Jamaicans, which we actually right. we actually used to idolize Born Jamaicans. Do you remember Born Jamaicans? Of course, you remember. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, I think they were, weren't they from, they weren't DC, from Miami. DC. They DC. were DC. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if, that, which, which Notch, Notch um, is one of my best friends. Yeah. Oh, Notch was actually one of the singers that was yes, there. Yes, Notch, Notch was the, well, Notch actually was the singer. And then Ed Le Shine was the, um, yes. was the, was the rapper, which he ended up staying in DC. Mm-hmm. And um, Notch um, left after that. Mm-hmm. So um, if you think about it, I remember Notch was on some of the early Black Chinese mix CDs. Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, but let's stop there. We're not going there yet. <laughs> you were yeah, not yeah, going yeah, down yeah. that Black Chinese. But I remember Notch. I do remember that name. It was N O T C H, not K N O T C H. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I remember that. Wow. And what was your DJ name back then? Also, D. My 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 name was always Dubs, derived from Jujups. Jujups was my nickname, and then right. they started to. Um, call me Buddha Dupes, and yeah. then after it just got shortened to Dupes, and then, and then, um, well, I guess when I was trying to figure out my DJ name, I think my brother is the one who's like, Yeah, man, you're my DJ Dupes because he used to call me Dupes, and it just stuck. Um, um, years later, like, I guess when I was like 18, no, um, mm-hmm. I met up with some guys, and um, their name was Rhythm Style in Southwest Miami, and then I started to work with them when I was like 18 and um, that's how I got the name Super on my name because we used to do these parties named Super Jams. And, and then after, in fact, Zachary Harding, which is Jeremy Harding, which was Sean Paul produce, uh, Sean Paul's producer at that one time, manager, not no more, mm-hmm. um, is the one who actually gave me that name. Okay. Uh, and you're talking, this is probably like 94, 95. Yeah, that's crazy there. And just remember, when you're getting names and stuff, you don't really know the value of this name and how far this name is going to take you and where you're going to see these names in lights. It's just, oh, I'm a DJ. I could live with this name here. Yeah, well, I, I, it just so happens that I, I guess it's because I, I, I didn't even know what dupes actually mean. I, I found out afterwards that dupes mean like... What was the meaning of it? Well, you said dupes, Don our dupes. Yeah, yeah, Don dupes, you know what I mean? Big man, bridging friend, you know Exactly. What I mean? And then after, it's just somehow I just got that name, Super Dupes, and yeah. people like it. I didn't particularly care for it. But okay. it just, <laughs> well, you just ran it with just, it. Just, yeah, it just stuck with me. You <laughs> That's know what I mean? so crazy there. And then what was the first song? Because you're DJing on your own, you're on the radio. And what was the first song you actually joined, you said? Um, name Rhythm Style. Rhythm style. Yeah. And they were in Northwest Miami? No, they were in South Miami. South, South Miami. Miami, like Kendall. Mm-hmm. And then I, I rocked with them for a little while. Um, mm-hmm. And then in the midst of all of that, too, uh, even I was playing on the Power 96, and then there was this new radio station that emerged yeah. the, that culturally shaped Miami in a different way. You no, know, it was a pirate radio station named Mix 96. Yes. yes, And I would go on Mix 96 under rhythm style name because uh, Power 96 is a commercial radio, so I had to play like songs that are pretty much more or less known and were more hip hop Mm -hmm. commercial influence. And then Mix 96, you could play anything. Because it was the pirate, pirate station, <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> so, uh, and through that radio station is where I met like DJ Khaled. DJ Khaled was also on that radio station. So you're talking this is 25 years ago. Crazy. Okay, I want to dig into uh, this radio station because I've heard about this radio station for as long as I've heard about Miami. I've heard about that radio station. How did you set up, How or even how was a pirate station set up back then, especially where there's no internet or anything? How did uh, they set it up, and where was this so, radio station? So the, the radio station was started by this guy named Daddy. Daddy saw, rest in peace, he passed away from leukemia. Okay. Um, Like, a little bit after that. And then um, it was him and bu- another guy we called Joey, Joey Butterfuco, which um he now manages Bujo. Okay. Uh, yes, and then mm. what they did is um they had this arena in Miami, um, and basically the arena had this uh, tall apartment building beside it. It was called Miami Arena at the time. It doesn't exist anymore okay. um, in downtown Miami. And this tall building was about 38 stories. So they, they, I guess they couldn't afford the 38 stories. So they were on the 37th <laughs> and they just hung an antenna up there with 100 watts and it would pick up as far south as where I live. Okay. 
Yeah, with 100 watts. And that's, and, that, how the station was born. and that's how the station was born. And this wow. is this is before Serato. This is records. Like so, you literally had to like bring the records upstairs with elevators and all of that stuff. Crazy. And then I guess they put together DJs. So this is Butterfuku and his partner running the station. And then the DJs coming in now were people like you, DJ Khaled. Who else was Papa at the Keith? Um, yeah. There was a girl named Lady Terra. Um, yes, I remember her. Um, it, it, was, it was a it was a bunch of different people. Like cool and Dre was on there. You know, Cool and Dre, the hip hop producers. Yeah. Yes. So they were on there too. So you're talking. This is early Miami. So and and the great thing about it, we're all still around. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Crazy. Um Yeah. So it, it, a lot of people won't know this history, and I'm I'm actually fortunate and will cherish these moments that I actually got to live through it. And that was the early days of the Fujis, and the Fujis actually blew up off of that station in Miami. You know what I mean? What? They actually went on there and I, I think they were performing with Buju at one time and then their thing went crazy. And that this is like before, like the Fuji law and all of that yeah. stuff. And yeah. So this is Wycliffe Praz and Lauren Hill. Yes. And then I guess at this time, because New York, I don't think was known for pirate radio station. That was more of a mm -hmm. Miami thing at that time. There. Yes. Yeah. Well, while I'm talking, Pirate Radio Station wasn't nothing new, you know, but um, the, the ingenious thing that that is saw did at the time, which which um, was Butterfuka's partner, mm -hmm. is that he know the higher up he goes, the, the longer range he can transmit. So uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, he had it in Fort Lauderdale, but it, it, it didn't transfer far because he was low. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you look now and you see like these TV antennas or cell phone towers, they're high up. Yeah. Um, so he figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> a little, sometimes a little bit of knowledge could be a very dangerous thing. Because why would you even know something like? How could you figure that out? And no YouTube or, or yeah. Google at the time, huh? Um, and it's somebody telling you. Okay, so then what was the vibe like at that radio station? What type of music? What were you and Khaled doing and other DJs and it, stuff? It, it, it was mainly. Um, Reggae, and then you had, and then Khaled used to be the hip hop DJ in there. But it was, it was just, it was the, the music that the streets wanted to hear. It was like the emerging music at the time mm -hmm. um, that the radio stations wasn't going to pull up because you know radio stations they, they just stick to what kind of works. And um, but with these with these programs on there, um, like said with with reggae. We used to have a reggae station here, but it was AM, and then they wouldn't go as hardcore just based on censorship and stuff like that. But with this, we were playing the music that was emerging out of Jamaica and stuff like that. And it it, it actually made and did a lot of wonders for reggae music and dancehall music in general, not only just for Miami, but because of these influential stations in Miami now. Yeah. People used to listen to Mix 96 and call in to Power 96, which is a legal station, and ask yeah. if they could play this song. And then a lot of the songs them got known because of Mix 96, like songs like Everyone Falls in Love Sometime, Tight Up Skirt, okay. um, Red Rat, and you know, like all these songs that, that blew up, like Mix 96 was like re pretty much mm -hmm. the people that helped to break that. Yeah, that, that's interesting there because, again, as you said, this is pre-internet. So this is basically like an internet station that you guys the, are running. Yeah, this is like 90. Picked up locally. Yeah, this is like 95, 96, yeah. 95, actually. Nobody's thinking about no internet then. No. <laughs> what, what, you, remember, you remember back then, cell phones, like I'm talking cell phones did exist, but not like this. You know what I mean? No you don't, way. You didn't have... Cell phones. <laughs> no, no way. Pagers, yes. Cell phones. Pagers, oh, yes. And then it's, you. And then after it's like you, you would have to like go to a pay phone now to call up yeah. and, and pray that somebody's <laughs> there. <laughs> and then they come meet well, you downstairs and yeah. yeah, so that was pretty much the process. You're crazy. Okay, and how long did that radio station last for? Um, that radio station lasted all the way up until probably just the other day, man. But like I'm talking due to their, the, it was a pirate radio station that will come in and out. But what that did know, they started some parties back in the day named Rockers Island. And that's when, yeah. that's when stuff really started to shine through. And like, mm -hmm. that's when Khaled really started to emerge as like an impact. Mm -hmm. And, and Khaled, Khaled was always tied to the, to the dance hall. Yeah. And when he started, he actually started as a dancehall DJ. So that man knows as much about 
reggae as anybody else. See what so I mean? He was originally a dancehall DJ that switched to hip hop. Yeah, exactly. No clue. Had no yeah. idea. I know he's been connected from time, but I didn't know that he started reggae and then went to hip hop. I thought yes. he was always hip hop. Yes. So, so let me tell you what happened now. So after the mix 96 days now, um, while I was still on par 96, by the way, mm -hmm. I started making Khaled's remixes for him. But before, let me back up a little bit before, but the, the all right. So my aunt now back in 94, 95 now, um, had, she, she was investing in me and my cousin cause she saw how serious we, she, uh, we were. And then she spent $5,000 on this drum machine, which I still have today. Okay. MPC 3000. And then um, me and my cousin now, going back to my rapping days, and we went to yes. Spec Shang. You remember Spec Shang Specialist? Yes, Shabba yes, Label. Yes, Shabba yes, Label. Yes, Shabba yes, Label. And yes, then, um, yes. one of the guys that worked there, we went to him and we played him our stuff. We were all excited. You know, we yeah. young kids. And, <laughs> and then he's like, basically, give it up and go find a day job. So I got yeah. demoralized. And that's what made me like really just go back into DJing all the way. But I still had this drum machine. Yeah. So I made use of it, and that's when I started the, the remixes. So whole, whole, what triggered me to do the remix? I remember the remixes that Chinese Laundry used to do back in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really interested in remixing. What, what really got me interested is Delano, when Delano started to do the remixes. So I remember he, um, he looped the Natural Mystic beat, and then he put... He put like another song over it, and I'm like, "Wow, that's cool." Yeah, yeah And so, that. so what I did know is because I had the ability to manipulate beats and all of that, because I had a drum machine, mm -hmm. um, I, I started to do remixes differently than Delano. And then um, I, I started to put out remixes. Like my brother now was he had a record shop at that point, and um, okay. and then I would give him these remixes, and then he would press them on wax. Which, which if you don't remember, like um. They had these remixes that they, I used to call white boy remixes. Okay. What were, what do you say? Why did you call them that? Because they would never think as a Chinese person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and literally that's the idea, but, but there was a, a remix that, um, the only remix I probably ever asked for. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't given to me. Uh, I asked Master Lee at the time for it. Master Lee, yes. when he used to play in Travelers. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then after he wouldn't give it to me and I just remembered it and then I remade it and when I put it on a hip hop beat 10 times better than the, the, the remix was, which was fed up. Well, poor people fed up, fed, fed up, fed, fed up. Well, poor people fed up on the hate me now beat. Okay. Because, okay. Since we're talking about that, that was the first time I met you 99. That was a remix that you gave to magnum force and they were playing in the dance before you guys started to play yes. that exact same one there yeah but that was on record that yeah. was that actually was our record and then after remember walk and live live talk mm -hmm. and dead dead yeah. walk yeah. and live and oh they come about so like a bull at chicago i did that too and you remember the remember the um the capitan um Hands up, hands up, hands up, hands yes. up. So me, oh, no, no one, any, and that, was, that was all me. But yeah, nobody, well, yes. nobody knew that at the time. And then, um, and then what, what really gave me my break is that I started to give those remixes to Khaled and started to make his, his remixes, and then it blew Khaled up. I see, because then now he has a different flavor that he's bringing to the party. Exactly. So, so he popularized what I was doing because you remember this, uh, these were bootlegs at the time. So I couldn't make anybody, you know, I never want nobody shoot. <laughs> so, yeah. so then what I did know is I, I, I gave these things to Khaled. And then after I started to make Khaled's own personal stuff, and this time though, I transitioned to Poison Art. Which was a little bit. It was a transition, and I met you a little bit after that. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, now is like Khaled blew up, like massive, massive, massive. And then, but Khaled didn't do this. Khaled didn't make mix CDs. So yeah. I saw. I used to go all the places with him now, and then I started to. I started to make Black China now. But how? Okay, Black so China then. Came about, how did Black China even, that name, how did that name even okay, come about? Okay, so how Black China came about now, so it was in my transition. Um, I went to Cayman Islands one time. Mm -hmm. So so with Rhythm Star, we, we were good, and people started to, like, book us out of the country. Like, we went to, like, Bahamas, St. Lucia. Okay. 
um, came and, and I remember I met this guy named Richard Flores, which Richard Flores um, managed Stylogy. No, he's still in the business. One, still one of my good friends. Okay. Um, so what happened now is that I met him from the Rhythm Style days, and this no the transition point when I left Rhythm Style now going into Poison Dart, and then he got in trouble in Cayman, so he came up from Cayman for a little, and he was at his sister's house at Fort Lauderdale, and he was like, I'm bored. I'm like, just come. And then he and I started Black China together. He was the Black, I was the China. But he left nice. shortly after that. So like when we did the first CD, he left. I guess he didn't know if it was going to blow up or not, but I, then I took the platform, and then it kept going. Mm -hmm. so, so even when I met you, you know, Black China was around at that time. You know? Even though you guys were playing Poison Dart. Exactly. But so was Black Chinese actually supposed to be a sound or was it just no, supposed it wasn't. to be a mixed CD? It, it, it wasn't supposed to be a sound. So let me tell you how Black Chinese gone. So it's like the first one, it just out of nowhere um, because I had to think about the whole things were done differently. So it's like everybody packaging would look the same. So I got this clamshell thing and then it was kind of hard to get it printed at the time if you didn't have right. the license. Yeah. So then I got, my friend had a color copier. So I just went there, got the circles and then I mm -hmm. color copied on it. And then I gave some to reggae wear at the time. That was a big shop that sold like Jamaican merch at the time. Got you. Um, and it just blew up from there. Like I'm talking like just because of how it looks, it just blew up. And, and this then, was number one. I'm talking, I don't know if it was number one yet, but it was just, it was just like, there was no CD that I was actually done like that. You know what I mean? That where the, every single mix was perfect. You remember everything up until that point was all done by Hanina. That's true. That's 100% true. So this one now, this one, I, I think I did it on ADAT. So even if I messed up the CD, um, I, I just rewind and then I correct it. And then now I introduced something that no other CD was doing at the time remixes so i started to put those same remixes that you know on the yeah. cds but these same remixes on the cds khaled were playing those oh, and yes. remember khaled was big at the time so no yes. because those mix those remixes were on my cds now everybody's like wow these are the remixes khaled play and literally that's how black china blew up and that's crazy. And so it was a win-win for all parties involved where it's like, exactly. okay, I'm giving you the material, but you're giving me the notoriety. So then I'm going to be pushing it and making my money and, from this. And hear this. And then the reason why I joined Poison Dart is access to their acapellas. <laughs> okay. That makes, okay. Cause listen, full disclosure, I was talking to, um, Kirkusy a couple of weeks ago and uh, he told me the original black Chinese like those bounties and stuff you're hearing, those were originally poison darts. Yes, they're poison, dart. poison dart. They're poison dart dubs. I even gave them to Kelly too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he didn't mind because I also yeah. gave poison dart these remixes too. But it it's just over a period of time that it it Black China just got bigger than poison dart. Then um, I had to make a move. You know what I mean? And then Bobby was there with me. Me and Bobby were working on poison dart together. And then I'm just like, yo, let's not change anything. Just come and we just we just did it keep it going well, a lot of people with black china was originally started by me and richard flores but mm -hmm. bobby did not originally start black china but bobby i would say bobby is an original part of black china because we grew it together as a song and you. and and the thing is now i remember in 2000 now my father passed away so i went down there mm -hmm. um and then word got out now this was by the time it was at black china four yes and then um all uh, i remember now going to the, i was down jamaica um for my father's funeral and stuff i ended up staying a little while word got out now that it was me and then i remember going around to master lee's studio mm -hmm. and then the place just crowded like got crowded with all these artists now wanting to be on black china this is before okay. black china had any dubs like that the okay. first person that actually gave away a dub you know is beanie man being an elephant man. Yeah, they didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because so so then no, it's like um, they all gave us dubs and stuff, but the, the dubs them only said super. It was Bobby Chin, and then I remember like I got the first set of dubs them now, and this was December two thousand. Um, and then 
I remember like the next time now, like um, we're getting more dubs and we didn't know that it was actually a song. Bounty Killer pointed it out to me and said, yo, youth, Black China is the song. Yeah. Bobby Chin and Super Dubs are the selectors. And then me and Bobby look upon each other and say, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> would you believe this entire time we never thought of it? <laughs> And so then, what did you think this black Chinese was? Yeah, because I don't know. You know what yeah. I mean? We're basically like young at the time, you know, and then um it's like um after that, like you would say like three months after that, Black Chinese was a worldwide name. That's when we blew up in Jamaica. March March two thousand and one. Right, so from December, you got your first set of dubs in December. You remixed them. I guess you had put out a CD right yes. after that. Yes, yes. That's where everything started to go. That's when everything started to go. And I think it, it just went, it went so fast. It went like 5 million miles an hour. Um, and definitely was not prepared for it. Definitely was not prepared for yeah. everything that came along with it. Um, and it was, it was... It was great at the same time and then not so great. You know what so, I mean? Okay. When did you notice that the CD started to bubble? What was the first indication? Because again, I don't think the internet was around those times. Yes, no, no. The internet started popping at the time. At the time, you had this site named Dancehall Reggae, and yeah, that's where scrappy. everybody used to go. Yeah, the, Scrappy. Mm -hmm. And um, I just remember now who, who I noticed that it, when it started to get big noise, it's all the attention we started to get and, and mostly attention from Jamaica. Remember at that time, mm -hmm. you if you're in dance hall, if you wasn't big in Jamaica, you wasn't saying nothing worldwide. So at we all. blew up in Jamaica as big as like a new artist. You know what okay. I mean? And so, especially coming from a foreign base because that's exactly. usually... It's usually if you're going to blow up in Jamaica, it's because you are in Jamaica and then you go out. It's weird for you to be from foreign, blow up in Jamaica, and then take you back to the well, world. Well, remember I said, that's the same, that's the same situation for Khaled, you know, because Khaled mm -hmm. really blew up in Jamaica. He, he got his name known in Jamaica, but then he really blew up in Jamaica, and then everybody started to know him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you remember, like, fully loaded, it was, I think it was fully loaded 2000. Or yeah. Then the Wyclef came down there, and, yes. and that's when the whole dancehall scene started to emerge. And then I would say, like, with all of that, no, I got acceptance mm -hmm. with, with the Black China thing, which, which with Canada now, mm how -hmm. Black China got known in Canada, believe it or not, is that same dance. Yeah. Black China actually blew up in Canada before probably everywhere else. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. The reason why is I remember um, when I was going to Canada now, and um, I was bringing some CDs with me. Mm -hmm um to sell and i guess nobody wanted to buy them they didn't know what the hell it was i remember at the time and i remember i remember that um the 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 people like the black people especially in, in yeah. scarborough <laughs> they used to look at chinese people as being corny you if you remember so I remember, it like, was I went, totally different i'll right. go into a china i'll go into a jamaica restaurant i may hear the people the man was like yeah, <laughs> yeah. so so what I did know is um, I went around with all the, the, the flea markets and shops and then I started to give everybody a CD. I probably gave you a CD at the time. Yeah, of course. You and came into the shop and gave it to me. And then, and then basically I said, yo, just burn it. And literally from that, mm -hmm. Black Chinese got known all over Canada. In fact, um, people like Drake and all these people that are you know, famous from Canada yeah. actually knows about me from those cds i wish that's crazy to me yeah no you that's know insane I mean? it was so monumental what black Chinese did it was epic and again as you said you you just wanted to make some remixes poisoner had some had uh, the acapella so okay yeah, i'll do some stuff yeah i can make some extra money on this i give the cow i get some notoriety but i don't think in your wildest dreams you could understand the movement that would have come came out of those scenes. no I, I i i didn't see it and really and truly it was started because i needed to pay a phone bill yeah i <laughs> yeah. know cell phones came out but cell phones were expensive so call me you know, after eight mcguad dance no it wasn't even before that it was like straight 25 cents a minute and this is us you know and if you people that muggle and say yeah this and that and and then after my muggle and muggle until the phone bill was five hundred dollar. Yeah. Apart from that time, I never said five hundred dollar yet, and that's how Black China was started. Okay, you need to find a way to pay a phone bill. So it's like almost like thank that phone company for that crazy bill. Yes, because that's what presented this crazy legendary thing, Black China. 
All right. And do you remember what number CD it was that you actually blew on? Um, Black China Four. It was number four. But 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 we were actually big big in Canada before that CD. We were we were big in Canada from Black China Two. From number two. From two and three. Yes. You know what? To tell you the truth, you're right because where I actually got, I think I got number. I never got one. I got number two and three. It was from this guy in Montreal. He yes. said, "Yo." This is the hottest stuff right now. And he sent it to me. I said, yo, what is this? We've never heard anything like this one day ever. And at first, it was like it was a different section of people that were buying it. It wasn't a hardcore dancehall crowd that was buying the Black Chinese. It was people that liked reggae, but they were more into hip hop. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what they wanted. Hey, give me that Black Chinese stuff. I, I, you know what? It's so crazy. Shortly after that, I met Cardinal Official. Yeah, and I, I met Cardinal Official in Jamaica, mm -hmm. I think probably in 2000, 2001, or probably 2001 at Bounty Killers Party, It's a Party. Okay. And Cardi and I have been pretty much cool ever since. You know and what I mean? And you Cardi. Were Black okay. Yeah, no, no, this was when Black China just started to bust. Yeah. And then um, Cardinal and I forged a relationship since then because Cardinal was pretty much doing the same thing. Yes, yes. As he was the artist, you guys were the DJ, so it exactly. made sense. You guys understood each other right away, just looking at right each other away. and say, hey, you're you, you're you. I get it. You know what I mean? Even if <laughs> nobody else gets you guys in the world, at least you two understand and see exactly. the vision from back then. Exactly. And, and it's, it's so crazy is that um, a lot of people that are innovating, I don't think really even know or even try to innovate. They just innovate because uh, I think all of that is just a, a product of just you doing a lot of great work. You know yeah. what I mean? You you do it from your heart. You do it with love. You do it with passion. And it can't be anything else than that. Or that that experience or that level of thinking would never happen. And a lot of it has to do with hunger too. You know, you know you're, yeah. you're tired for Brooke. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> all of them years. Yeah. yeah. So you need something like, can I get something so I can actually get moving and start it? You yes. know what I mean? Understand. Okay, so then now you have the CDs. These are doing good. So then now when did the production start to take? Oh, uh, well, well, the production started to take place. Um, I think um, the, that same time that my father died, um, was mm -hmm. the, the week that he died is the same week that I dropped Black Chinese 5. Got you. And then from Black China 5, no, it was just phenomenally crazy. And then yeah. we were in Jamaica every other week. We're charging some big money for at the time. We're charging probably three, four times what a regular song, Stone Love, would charge in Jamaica. What? And, yeah. And then um, just leading up after that, no, I think the following year, mm -hmm. um, I made Black China 6 because I wanted to switch it up now. Okay. So I made a mix CD that was supposed to be Black Chinese Six, mm -hmm. but then I, I I just it was just so much going on at the time. That's when I told you like things got crazy. You no. Know? Mm -hmm. Um. So what was going on in the background is that yes, no, we're getting famous worldwide. Then money didn't even start coming in like that yet. Okay. And then no, all of a sudden no, you see a lot of greed started to happen. From jump. From jump. Yeah. And then you see a lot of hating. You remember even dancehallregga.com. I, I don't think dancehallregga.com liked us because we were going against the grain of what traditional dancehall was. And that side hated us. I remember the first time I saw that, mm -hmm. it broke my heart. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because I'm just like, yo, I'm doing this so good. Um, and you don't like what I'm doing. And they, they just bad mouthed me. Yeah. And then you now all of the DJs then that you, you were cool going up with you now just because you started to get more popular than them started to sabotage you. Crazy. In addition to that, then a lot of begging started to happen. Then then not only with that, with family, with friends, with and then after it was just a pretty sad moment. So the, the CD that was supposed to be Black Chinese 6 now, I just remember like I kind of got depressed at the time. I could have bought finish it. And it was a promo CD named Bubbles, which that blew up worldwide too. Yes. And yes. it was a promo CD. Mm -hmm. For like a dance or something like that. Yeah, for a dance. And it, it was, mm -hmm. that's all that originally was a Black Chinese 6. And then mm -hmm. I wanted to switch it up. I'm just like, man, I'm bored. Mm -hmm. So then Black Chinese 6, I put a lot of my own beats on there, which which some of the most of the beats on there I think was made with me and my cousin at the time that lives in Canada. Um, I call 
Freddie was yeah. Teddy, didn't he? Yeah. Um, and then that was not well received. It, it literally wasn't. wasn't. I remember because that was the one where they quote unquote said it flopped because you guys were super sky hot, red hot up until that point there. No, but, but we never, we never ever dropped, you know, because we, we were still getting booked like crazy. Yeah. Um, it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say it flopped because it's either you loved it or you hate it. And believe it or not, most people actually loved it because it was, it was just a very bold step. Yeah. And no, in hindsight, looking back, I'm glad that I was that bold to make that step. Mm -hmm. So coming after Black Chinese 7, I'm going to the production mm -hmm. so shortly. Mm -hmm. So when Black Chinese 7 came about now, so this time we were red fire hot. Like, no, we, not only Jamaica wanted us, no, the world wanted us. So yeah. you're talking, I just remember touring so much. Like literally, we, me and Bobby were never home. So no, we had to actually start bringing in other people to help us fill some of these dates. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, like you would say like Black Chinese 7, I think was literally made like on the road, like mm -hmm. partially on the road. And um, and then it's like we made that now. And then after Black China 8 came around now, and then I'm just like, you know what? I kind of probably hit them a little bit too much with my beats. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm going to put one beat on there. And that beat was cooperating. Wow. And this is where that's the production what, thing started. That's where the production thing started. But even before that, I was doubling in it still. Um, mm -hmm. um, like um, I was working with Danger Zone at the time, which um, which they had a hit to. You remember the the Jackier song, Please Call Jamaica. Yeah. And so I made that for them. You made that? Yes, I made that for them. They didn't know that. Yep, and, and just a bunch of other things in between, but like, but the Copa on the Black Chinese CD was really what catapulted my production. It also catapulted Black China to a different height as well. Okay. Because no, we weren't just a sound now. We we were a sound and then no, we're, we're having hits, you know what I mean? Yeah. And fr from that, I, I just went to like many other things. Um, It was Joel Chin, uh, one at a time, well, no, actually, you know what? Who oh, I met my manager now, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Mr. Morgan, Morgan. Is, from, is from Canada. At the time, he used to manage Cardinal. He works with um, with with Ovio now. So, so let me. In fact, I, I can't even remember my discography. So, mm -hmm. I remember I take a Jack Creation dub, which was which was the the Capleton. Who you call a nigga? Which, yeah. which you know we we're Splice Masters at the time. <laughs> so Splice out their name. And then I put it on the corporate him on my CD, yeah. and then I put a bunch of dubs on it. And um, and I remember giving Mr. Morgan one now. And Mr. Morgan is like this one. He was working with Nina Sky, so okay. the, this one they had the song on the Coolie Dance we Move, Yeah, body girl. So they needed a second single. So then he hit me up and he said, "Whose beat is this?" And I'm like, "It's mine." And literally, that's how it happened. And from okay. that day on, Mr. Morgan has been my manager, sixteen years now crazy because remember this group they weren't they didn't really have a big they had their one song that was bubbling but they hadn't gotten that catapult that they needed yet yes and i think it was a second single that really did better for them than their first single the first single did extremely well i, I, I would say the first single did better but the but my single did well um because it was their second single but the problem with, with between my single and the first single is my single never had a video because I think them and the label followed around that time. Yeah. You understand? Mm -hmm. But but it was still massive worldwide anyways. But that was literally the first song on the like legit song on the beat. And then when that started to bubble now, that's when um Joel Chin, rest in peace, mm -hmm. worked for VP, mm -hmm. um, called me and said, Yo, can can I use this song um on the C D cable and I'm like, ask him if it if it's available, like if he did it for anybody. I'm like, no. And then literally my license hit Pandir, and then I went to Jamaica. And I remember I got Jamaica now, and I had like I had a few grand. I, I don't remember how much it was. It was like ten grand I had with me or something like that. Mm -hmm. And my all of it got on there and come up back with three songs. So two from Elephant Man, which one was Father Elephant? Yes, on and the same beat. One, yeah, on the same beat, and one from Vibes Cartel, and then. Then I had the Nina Sky and then Notch voice on it too. Notch, Notch actually, I think 
Not actually was the first song on it. Everybody wanna be no that I remember because when I was making the beat, that's when he wrote it. Mm-hmm. It's when I was making the beat, Notch was Notch and Willichin was who made me identify that it actually was a hit. Um, and then I kind of was like demoralized because I'm like, damn man, this these men think some of all type of money, you no, know, and charging yeah. me all type of big figure. <laughs> yeah. And I just put out those songs. I, just, I literally just put out the, those first few, and every other song, mm-hmm. it, it blew up, and then everybody else was just sending me songs. Okay, so were those those originally came out on CDs or records, or they were just for the mix CD? No records. Records. They came out on records. Yeah. If you if you study Black Chinese, those songs are actually not on a mix CD. I never put those. The only song out of out of those songs, I think that was came out on the Copa, legit wise, yeah. was VIP from Notch. Yeah. And um and who you call a nigga? That's it. Yeah. And the rest were strictly that was forty fives. Yeah, exactly. And 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 I remember Sean Paul voiced on it. Um, it was like it would say like. The beat had it was on like six different major labels. So Tammy Chin voiced on it, Sean Paul, David Banner, um, Pitbull did a remix with um with Nina Sky. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it just it just went crazy. And and then after that, now um I met well, this is when a young Rihanna when she was 16 years old, getting signed. I'm, on, I'm actually on her first album. And I remember Cardinal, Cypher songs all had something to do with it. And they wrote me in. And, and then after that, like, um, I started to work with Kali Buds. Okay. Yeah, so then after that, now, Kali Buds. Hold on one second. Before we get to Kali Buds, with the Rihanna, what song did you actually produce on her album? I actually did um, No, 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 which was a, with the cartel on it, which which I didn't like the production at the time because I think those guys really messed up what I did. Okay. Um, her managers at the time are, are people I was signed to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I did a remix to Unfaithful. A little bit what? after. Yeah, the reggae remix to Unfaithful. Yes, I, I remember that 100%. Yeah, yeah so... So I did that. She even performed it at um, on some fest. I forgot so, it was at some fest. <laughs> yeah, man. So um, after that, it was Kali Buds. Um, from I did, Bermuda. From Bermuda. So I did. Um, I did. Tomorrow is another day. Mm-hmm. Um, then I did Blind to You. Blind to you. Blind to You is still one of his Big biggest. Big song. Big song. And then I Big did song. another song named Sensor Miller for him. Um, then after that, I went and I worked with Notch. I did, I produced like, I was probably like the, every song that he actually had on there went to my computer and I probably produced like nine songs on it when he was doing like a Spanish album. Okay. <laughs> and then after that, I actually have to look at my, my, my <laughs> I remember. Go ahead. Don't worry. Go ahead. What is you putting in so much work? It's hard to remember chronologically what you did. And then after that, I did Estelle, which is what? Won't you come over, love, so I can show you love? And and um, John Legend wrote it with her, or I guess wrote it for her, because mm-hmm. um, she was signed to John Legend at the time. Which I actually met her through Cardinal, like some number of years before that. You know what I mean? This yeah. is what she was still in the UK. Then, then after that, I did um, Cardinal's number one. Number one, that was with Rihanna. Yeah, that is how you You did that, dupes. Yes, number one. Okay, so this is my question: How did you get from the dancehall world to now the hip hop R and B world? How did that transition happen? Well, that was the song that made it happen because up until that point, everybody kind of stuck me in a box of just doing reggae. Yeah, and nobody wanted any hip hop or whatsoever from me, so. Basically, that song kind of changed it for me. And I went on and produced other things for Cardinal on that project as well. Then I, then John Legend came back to me and then I produced the Can't Be My Lover with Buju in it. Have a piece of body with... And I produced the song No Other Love with Estelle on it. Then, um, then I, I, I just... And then after that, it's like um, moving on down now. So remember, I, I'm kind of skipping out a bunch of things. So... So now what solidified me now from like making people know that I don't just do dancehall, reggae or Caribbean influenced things mm-hmm. is when I did Mary J. Blige each tier. Yes. 
brother, uh, hold on. You're going to tell this story, but let me tell you something from a, a outside person looking in. Yeah. You see, when I heard that song, and I heard it was produced by Dopes, buddy, the way how my heart felt, I said, listen, I know this man. It's like, you guys don't know. I know this man. This man came to the shop. We sat down, we talked, we're in a dance hall type of thing. I know this man. And he produced one of my favorite artist songs. That right there and hearing the bass line in that song there. I said, Which version did you know? You knew the one with Jack here or you knew the one with the other artists? The one with, I think it was the first. The Jack here came out second? The Jack, the Jack here was never officially released, you know, but I, I had put it out because I labeled it the one. To release it, but Pooh Bear actually wrote it. You know, Pooh Bear who write all of Justin Bieber hits though. Pooh Bear wrote Jack Harris part. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. But, no. But, but that uh, um that was a massive hit um worldwide. Um it wasn't it wasn't a hit in the US like that, even mm -hmm. though it was her first single. Mm -hmm. Well no, her first single was different here. That was her first single worldwide went like number one in Italy, top 10, like in all of like from Australia and stuff. And um, so that's when people started to take me seriously. And then after that, no. So hold um, on. Yeah. how did you even get to Mary J. Blige in the first place? And what was that phone call like coming? How did that whole situation happen? You know, I actually don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, you know what? I, I think, um, you know what? Actually, I do right now. So that beat originally was made, um, I guess Alicia Keys was working at the time and she wanted beats. And then me and my cousin Khan made that track and then we sent it um, out and they liked the beat. And then somebody sent it to um, Jante Austin, mm -hmm. which is our next huge writer. Mm -hmm. And then he actually wrote the, the, the top line on it. And then after we sent it into Alicia Keys, she declined it. Then we sent it over to Interscope, or Geffen at the time, and then they loved it. Yeah. And then they cut it. And then after that, no, um, then came Eminem. Monster. This is now when the Grammy came into play because of yes, the situation. Yes. There. How did that come up now? So, all right. So that was my manager used to share office space with um, at Shady Records. And then he, w he used to see them every day. And then I was just like sending beats and stuff like that. And then he gave Eminem people a beat CD, and that was one of the beats that Eminem picked, and then it was on the album. And that, and then that album went on to win a Grammy. And then in that, around the same time, though, is when, you're talking, it's like 2009, that's what, like when I met Drake now. And then I was supposed to be on Drake's first album. It skipped me, though, because somebody leaked the song. But the song eventually ended up coming out on the mm -hmm. Tiger. So you did us. So then it's a uh, tiger feature in Drake or it's Drake featuring it's tiger. It's tiger feature in Drake, which is they have still got it for you. But it's originally a Drake song. It was originally supposed to be on his first album, but it got leaked. And then I kind of was bummed out about it because remember, I said Drake was the new hot boy at the time and hot like fire but, at that but time. I, but, I, but I still was blessed because it was like I got Eminem. Come on, man. I, I, I remember, remember this is when Eminem. This is when Eminem was just coming off his drug addiction, and and then that's why the album was called Recovery. And then in after that, now mm -hmm. there was this young artist named Bruno Mars that came around, and I was on the first album. My heart, my heart yeah. dopes. So then I did, um, I did Liquor Store Blues. Yes. And then I did. Um, it's called our, 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 it's called our first time, our first time. So I did those two. And then on that same beat CD that Eminem had from me, which never made the album, yeah. no, him and Royce, the Five Nine, were reuniting. And the group was called Bad Me Seva, which was like 10 years prior to that. They were, they were together. They fell out. Then they got back together. And they chose my song as their first single, which was called Fastly. So you say how oh, I transitioned out of dancehall. Yeah. And then after um, I went into hip hop. Crazy because what I find is okay to me. This is again from me looking from the outside in. It seems like once you're a producer in the reggae field, you're more the producer and the label. But then when you go over to hip hop now, you're strictly producer. You could go wrong and do other stuff, but you're not the label. You're just producer, and there's yeah. more steps to it there. Yeah, more way more steps. It's just it's just a different level. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after that, now I'm skipping out a couple things, and then the, the tiger came out.
mm-hmm. which was probably like two years after that, which was the Tiger still got it for you. I don't know if you remember that song. Yes, still got it for you. So that was it. Um, and then um, what happened now is then I finally got on a Drake project now. Which project was this year? Take Care. Take Care. So that was the second album. And then, um, but I did, I, I was kind of pissed because they gave me the interlude, which, which I, I was still grateful, but guess what the interlude was? Which one? The one we buried alive with Kendrick Lamar and that blew Kendrick Lamar up. Dry. <laughs> crazy. And because at this time here, Kendrick Lamar was not who Kendrick Lamar is right now. No, uh-uh. he was a virtually unknown, but but he was well respected. Drake loved him. And then Drake sent him the beat. He did that. And Drake is like, yo, this thing's just so damn wicked. I don't even find myself on it. And then then he just like, I guess, put it as an interlude yeah. right after Marvin's room. And, and then after that, so moving on now, then Bruno Mars. Well, I did, I did a Christina Aguilera. I never did anything. Um, Bruno Mars came back around. Okay. Um, and then I did Show Me on, on, on an Orthodox fruit box. What? Then um, I, I went and worked um, with, um, with Snoop Dogg, which is called Snoop Lion at the time. I did one song on there named Smoke the Weed with Collibuds. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess, how did that Snoop Lion come around? How, was, how did that deal actually pan out? Um, it was just... Um, it, it, it's just you know the thing is as as you as you go along well you know actually my manager now was at RCA Records and he lined it up mm-hmm. so so um that's how that came about he actually signed that 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 record so of course I was going to be on there okay. but but, but this I think, is still Mr Morgan yeah this is still Mr Morgan he moves around a lot in this yes. industry yes so and then a little bit after that um I did a Juicy J which ended up coming out um. And it was the first record that um, major record that there is a very known producer now. That was the first record that he was on. So he and I did it. It's called 1985. So that was the first record he was ever. And that, and I'm also his mentor. It's it's like I don't know why you just didn't because you said when you moved from Jamaica you came to Canada and then went to the states. Why didn't you just stay back in Canada? Because it seems like a lot of your epic moments and or epic just, relationships just, came out of Canada and yes. are still coming out of Canada. Well, the, the thing is, is for one, um, I don't think my mother wanted the coal. And then you remember I said Canada, remember I say, hold oh, the U.S. views on Canada. All you got to do is watch South Park. And that was their views on Canada, the friendly neighbors to the north. <laughs> yeah. Canada wasn't like, quote unquote, cool back in the day. But, no, no, no. no. But, but I always had a great relationship with um, ca- Canadians in mm-hmm. general because I just thought you guys kind of more stuck together. Y'all were cool. Mm-hmm. Y'all, y'all were just like loving people. And I always like, you know, the Jamaican scene, just too, too much hype, man. Hype. Hype. And, and, and then after that, no. Um, mm. um, I kind of like... There, there wasn't a lot of things happening for me at that moment. So it's like, I kind of like, like my manager, no, he went on to go work with, um, with OVO them. And then um, the same attention that I was getting from him, I wasn't getting it anymore because he got way busier. You know what I mean? So, so, so remember all to... my placements at this point, and I was mostly placed by him. Got it wasn't you. really me, really. Mm-hmm. It was more like his links. And then he basically did all the work for me. So this time I had to learn to do my own thing. So you got lazy, man. You got comfortable. Well, after that is like I started to I went and I just told my manager, I'm like, yo, I want to go produce bands. And he's okay. looking at me like crazy. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, I want to go produce bands. So then I started to work on the bands in the California reggae scene. Okay. Which which they're not really huge in Canada or huge in Jamaica, but they're massive all throughout, like the U.S. Like I'm talking, they pull more people than actual Jamaicans that come to the States. Okay. Or, yeah, or, or even worldwide. They pull like a lot more people than that. And that was just something that, that, that is actually what I think really taught me how to produce. Because, no, I had to learn how to direct everybody you know what i'm saying so i went to produce soldier which soldier is massive you can look them up i went to produce like from dirty heads mm-hmm. i produced for like um 
well, so they call Re- revolution, just a lot of the California reggae scene at the time, sublime with Rome. Um, and then after that, now, um, let me see where else. Then, fast forward, I'm just skipping out a bunch of things. Michael Franti too. And then from me coming out of that, I did that for a while, but it, it didn't seem fruitful for me. But like I was the go-to producer for, for the scene, so everybody now wanted me to work on their stuff. And around what years were these here? Um, That was probably, that was around between 2015, 2016. Okay, so this is relatively not too long ago. Yeah. Within the last five years. Yeah, two, I would say 2014, 2015, 2016. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I'm just like, man, this ain't lucrative. Mm-hmm. And then Drake came back around. And then after me come from like you talking coal as ice for all these years in the in the in the mainstream like the that world yeah then bam out on the controller <laughs> big monster massive suck. listen I need you to take time with this one and tell me how controller even came around and because I know it's um actually you. Is boy, it one, boy, word, and boy, one, Steve, Stephen McGregor, the genius. Okay. Yes, that worked on control. It. Tell me how that came around. That so, from the right. idea. So the the idea of it is basically it was we were just doing like Boy Wonder came down to Miami at the time, and then it's like um, somebody else, which Seven Thomas was supposed to come down, but I guess he must either forget him passport or or them never allow him entry. I don't know what it was. Yeah. And then he never came. And then it was me, Vinyls, Alan Ritter, Boy Wonder at the studio. And then I'm just like, hey, Stephen lived right around the corner from the studio. This one, the genius moved up from Maya, mm-hmm. uh, moved up to Miami from Jamaica. Yeah. And I'm just like, yo, come. So Stephen and Boy Wonder was in the room and Stephen came up with the chords. And then Boy Wonder was doing like some hip hop drums. And then after it's like, you know what I mean? Then do my touch to it. And then after he's... I, because it was not something that we thought about. It was it's just a very bare beat, you know? Yeah. No, and, when, when, when you think about it, yeah, it's not super complicated. And then it's like I was supposed to go back in now, and um, because me and Boy Wonder use two different DAW systems. We use FL Studio, I use Ableton. Okay. So I was I took it back now, and I was supposed to work on it, I guess, to dance all it up more and stuff. But he sent it in as it was, and then mm. two tools, that was controller. Crazy. Yeah. And is that the one originally had popcorn on it and then yes, they took out yes. popcorn and put in the beanie man yes okay yes. can you talk about that um well the popcorn I, I think that version never came out um because it was leaked and it was leaked by one of popcorn people but um and i i, I think they just like they just left it as a leak and then after they just changed it but either way a lot of jamaican people would be like um Yo, why they took out popcorn? Yo, dog, that's not good, yo. And then I'm just like, yo, at the end of the day, it didn't matter to me. <laughs> <laughs> it really did it. Yeah. As long as it came out and it became, it did what it did. And then um, I was also blessed with another massive hit. In fact, this hit was actually bigger worldwide, which is too good. Yes, yes and, and then, it was a dancey type of because that was a Drake and Rihanna, and that was a dancey type of feel to it. So what what that was now is that now you remember the first record that I told you that eighty five was on with me, and that was his first big record. Mm-hmm. No eighty five said dubs, let's work. So I'm just like cool. So um, it was this guy named Manish that he did like the music on top, and then. Um, I sent the drums into 85 and then that was just put together and but I don't know, it just it just came out amazingly. And that was also a blessing. And with that there, do you actually after you guys produce it now, do you actually sit down in the studio with Drake and Rihanna and then you guys record it or your job no, is no, to no, produce no. and send off? Well, I'm talking a, a lot, a lot of things I am actually in the studio with the artists. Mm-hmm. Um, but but this one no, I wasn't. Mm-hmm. So, and this is the time I think Drake and Rihanna was dealing now. So it's like, um, yeah, wouldn't you, it's like, sometimes you know that you've created this thing, but sometimes don't you want to see 
how this thing is being used from beginning or i guess as a producer you learn to detach yourself from the product after you I, I i learned to detach myself from the product from very early on because even even the first version of the nina sky turning me on i hated it if you notice there's two different versions of yeah. it you have the ones with pitbull so what what they did to the, my original version i was mad and then um then the one that's on the original Copa was counted as a remix, but that's not the original version. So, but I've learned that that song benefit, benefited me immensely. So after that, I've just learned like, yo, once it's in their hands, you do whatever. Like, yeah. I don't really care. It's like, if it hit, it, I don't feel like it. Everybody else does. That's why I get it. I, I, I just work on it enough as if the client like it, then I'm happy. Okay, because a lot of people don't realize as a producer, you're dealing with client services. You're not really facing the world per se. It's mm -hmm. from your mind to your computer to the client, and then the client goes and yeah. do what they want well, with it. Well, it's like if you're if you at um, a store, you know what I mean? As long as it's customer service, as long yeah. as they're happy, they're happy. You know yeah. what I mean? I, you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what it actually takes to create a hit or this is just something that is just it's, magic. You, you don't you don't never know what a hit is man it's like honestly you just you just have to um you even even most of the songs that i love mm -hmm. are not the hits okay. you know what i mean because i probably love it because i've done something new on it that was just so mind-blowing <laughs> but then it's probably too complicated for other people so it, it's you you can never predict what a hit is because mm -hmm. it, it's 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 so many different things and it's, it's like so many other plans I had. And I say, yes, this is it. This is my retirement fund now. And it just never pops off. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, because so, a lot of people don't understand that there's so many different levels. So, okay, let's say even the, the Drake and Rihanna record. From the day you stepped in the studio, you and um, 85 stepped in the studio, recorded this till the day it came out. How long of a process is that? Um, it, it all depends. You're talking like even with said the M and M stuff. Um, um, you're talking that beat was probably had for like a few years before it even came out. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. So, so you never know. Sometimes it's a month. Sometimes it's two years. Sometimes yeah. it's three years. You you don't ever know. It's just that's how unpredictable it is. And I guess that's why you try your best not to really get attached to a project. You put it out. And then you will we'll figure it out along the way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the great thing with music itself, too, is you just never know when it's actually going to blow up, where it's going to blow up from, and what actually even made it blow up. No, you don't. It's, it's just, uh, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just you never know what the hit is, you know? Yeah. So, it, but, the, but the, the most important thing is, that's why I say, if you're doing it for money, mm -hmm. you're doing it for any other reason, apart from loving it mm -hmm. i don't know your success is not going to last long because i've i've been this is my 16th year since i had my first massive hit you know what i mean 16th 17th year and and mm -hmm. and it's i'm still here you yeah. know what i mean and from from i made the transition as a dj into a producer mm -hmm. no because you're saying 16 years of created hits and you would say your last when was your last massive hit that you I would heard? I would I would say it's between control and um and, and too good and that was four years ago that was four years ago and what have you been doing in the meantime the past four years per se what has super dope's life look like in those four years oh boy it's 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 um <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you heard the rumors mm -hmm. you know what I mean which the rumors are true but you, you heard what rumor have you heard <laughs> um i'll let you tell it in your own words well well the rumor is that i've, I've been working on this rihanna stuff which i've ne I've never commented on it or or said anything about it from before yeah which which um yes i have you know what i mean but i will just make make i will tell that story when it comes out fair, so you know you know what fear enough so okay so we have a confirmation that there's something in the atmosphere out there but there's no date when there's something in the atmosphere out there is supposed to come out exactly so if so if and when it comes out then i will be able to speak on it Crazy. but but, there, but there's a lot of things under the background so even um after that um so it's like um 
I would say another big hit that I was on is I produced Party Next Door with 1985 again, Not Nice. Yes. yes Early, Not yes. Nice, you're rude. Then um, I went on, I produced, I went on produce with um, Shakira. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm on her album. I have a good amount of cuts on her album. Her last album that came out, that won two Grammys. So how um, many Grammys do you have under your belt now? Like six or seven, but, but nomination over 20. Over 20. Yeah. Something I didn't ask you. We're going to stick to this point here, but something I never asked you. What was the feeling like when you actually found out that you won your first Grammy for the Eminem? Um, it was it was amazing. Um, at the time, because it's like it's something where you always dream about, and and to be a part of a project that actually win a win a Grammy is it's it's amazing. You know what I mean? But it's like after that one, I didn't care anymore. Yeah, <laughs> you know, those on the walls and all that yeah. stuff. I actually don't even care about that anymore. I just use it as more of a gauge right now to to do to me doing good work. You yeah. know what I mean? So it, it's, it's like these things don't even make me anymore. It doesn't, I really don't care. Like, in fact, uh, my wife is the one who hung these things up on the wall. I had just had them on the floor. Yeah. And it's crazy to think where you're coming from. And once somebody said Grammy to you at one time, it's like, holy smokes, Grammy, Billboard, American Music Award. All of these things seem so unattainable and so amazing. But I guess it's something like, I guess it's like money too. After yeah. you get your first dollar, every dollar seems the same after a while. Um, I would have said so. I'm talking, you definitely, when the money starts to go, like, it's like, all right, cool. But you know, the problem is with a lot of the youths, them, especially with myself, um, you, like, you get this big money now and you feel like you're going to get it again. But but, but a lot of people get it and then get comfortable and start buying what they want and they realize that they actually have to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> At, as a producer, are you basically considered as good as your last project type of thing? Yes, that's that's how it works. It coming like any anything like with like with an artist of Jamaica, mm -hmm. um, it, or, or any kind of artist, you're just as good as your last project. So mm -hmm. if you're not like actively like having hits or whatever, then you get cold. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then once you get cold, it's kind of hard for you to to actually like get placements. I'm. I would say right now I'm probably a little cold, but uh, but I'm but I'm respected. So it's a difference. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's really what it comes down to because it's not like you were super hot and then you did a lot of crazy stuff and crash and burn and then you're trying to get back up. You exactly. just basically did a lot of stuff and then you just said, okay, you know what? I'm gonna cool out for a while. Exactly. That's a that's a big difference between crashing and burning exactly. and trying to rebuild. I, I, one of the things that I always made sure that I did was was to keep my face clean. Um, uh, I'm not going to say that I didn't make mistakes, which everybody does. You know, what I mean, nobody's perfect, but I always try to do unto others as they do to me, and um, try to just do everything clean from my heart. Um, um, and and yes, I've been hurt uh, many times in it, um, mm -hmm. and. Which no, I'm really finding out now that um, I was hurt by those people because they're their self are hurt. You know what I mean? Like hurt people, hurt people. Yeah, hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. So it, it's it's, but it, it was years of dealing with all these this negativity because it's like I told my story, but um, don't think that it was easy for one second. Even though I was immensely blessed, made a lot of money, traveled the world, worked with many different artists. To whatsoever still didn't fulfill me you know what i mean okay um and i would say like you know what i mean i'll still go in and out of like being depressed and you know what i mean i'm human too you know what i mean it's like people people see it from the outside and then them don't them don't really know what it is and then mm -hmm. you had you know you're kind of after the years of people like wanted to take advantage of you it's like it might help somebody once but no it's like oh cool the flood door open up don't know for them shame tree don't know so they're gonna ask you again and then you don't give them and then all of a sudden them, them hate you and it's like them things that i couldn't never get and did but you like, find that the request started to become a bit more ridiculous than when you first started oh up? absolutely the the higher up you go they, they always get more ridiculous um mm -hmm. it is just no it's like the craziness with it now is like you you will see like the the, the amount of greed and how much people think you actually owe them. And 
and and that was really like the hurtful part because it's like no matter what is like even you might help somebody out and and then you you don't see like it is reciprocated. You are, you honestly feel away, even though you're not supposed to do anything and expect anything back in return. But sure. it wasn't reciprocated, so then you you feel away, not necessarily because you want anything back from them, but you expect yeah. them to actually have the same kind of compassion yeah. you showed them, and to at least call you once in a while. And then no, when you see that noise, like you say, all right, cool. It you was just never for me from from day one. But so, then you had to go through all of this to really figure this out you know and i mean which is the bad part because if you knew this from the jump you wouldn't go through all of this you wouldn't have to deal with these people that are going to come with these hurtful ways of thinking and doing what you're doing but you know what though i'm actually glad that i went through it and i think that was just a part of my life that was written for me for actually coming up to the part where i'm at right now okay you know what i'm saying so yeah. after all that hurt after all that pain and you're talking this is not this is not just like within the last two years or whatever you're talking is is probably pain that i've been carrying from my childhood okay um no so it's like whole negativity works it just builds up 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 it just build up build up build up it's infectious and then one day you just blow your lid mm -hmm. so I, I think i just got to my point probably sometime last year now after being burnt so many times how evil people can be how greedy people can be mm -hmm. and um um and even though i had no reason to be the feeling anyway because my life is absolutely blessed i have a beautiful family i have my kids love my wife very much um music afforded me this lovely house um i'm not starving but it's like honestly money don't solve any of those issues because if you're if you're not happy within you first mm -hmm then you're going to always be sad. It'd be like if I gave you a thousand dollars and says and, and you can't save it. What makes you think you're going to save a hundred thousand? Not because exactly. that's the money, it's just you have to change. So with, with that changes it, it 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 actually brought me to Christianity. You know what I mean? And I, I would say that that is what ultimately led to my peace where I'm at right now. You know what yeah. I mean? Um mm -hmm. and I wasn't coming on here to preach to a lot of people, but I want to tell you that God is real. One hundred. Um, um, and it, it is it's the most glorious thing that ever happened to me in my life. Um, and this is my new path. I don't, I don't know what the future holds, but wherever the good Lord <laughs> shows me where to go, that's where I'll be going. You know okay, so let's let's go into this then, because again, you're living the high life. Everything is good. You know what you feel in your heart, but you got to put on this smile, make all these stuff and get all these awards and stuff. Where was actually the breaking point? Do you remember like the night where you just basically said in your mind, like, yo, I can't take this mo no more. There has to be more so, to life. Something happened. Where was so, it? So basically it's like about four years ago. Um, I'm working on this particular project now where the, where literally the world was reaching out to me mm -hmm. and, um, it felt good to feel important, feel wanted. Everything was good and glorious for the time. And then um, when it come time, now we're doing like the paperwork and stuff. And then I'm finding how people are greedy. I'm just like, yo, if you didn't know it was this artist, you would have never ever tried to come at me like that. Or you know what I mean? And and then you just start to figure out how selfish people are and I, yeah. and, I, and and self centered and and focused on themselves. Um, no matter what you did for them, you know what I mean. Um, and then I would say, oh, at this time though, like fast forward now, up to two years ago, um, it was the biggest I ever was, a balloon, my weight balloon, um, okay. I was getting sick. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking sick to the point like where my eyes would swell up and stuff from blood pressure, stress. And I'm like, oh, it's either I stay doing this or I get rich and then I'll be dead mm -hmm. or I spend all my money and what I would I get rich from in my health? Or I just have to take a stance in doing it now. So I actually walked away from that for for six months. By the time the six months come around now, when done, I'm saying, hey, I'm here. People heard that I'm not doing the project anymore. So all these people that were supposedly like friending me up or were my best friends, were they were most of them were nowhere to be found anymore. So it kind of really hit me. You know what I mean? I'm just like, and then it's like I went 
all of last year now up until August, like just trying to find it back, trying to find back a groove. And then I remember like August came around now and it's like, I'm, I'm like hitting up these people. And then they're either telling me they're busy, they don't respond. And all of a sudden I wasn't important anymore because I'm not doing this project. You really? say, yeah, so you're talking, no, this, this was a year after now. And it's like, all of a sudden I just wasn't important. And I'm like, yo, you know what? I'm not going to call anybody and nobody called me. Mm -hmm. But I think that was God way of telling me that, yo, stop putting the importance and don't, don't make other people be your happiness. You have to find your own happiness and focus on the people them that really are here for you. Mm -hmm. And it was my family. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then I had learned to live with that. So by the end of December now, one of my new year's resolution was to protect my energy at all costs and a little over two weeks after that, I gave my life to Christ. And you know who my pastor is? He's a very okay. famous um, Jamaican rapper that gave his life to Jesus 23 years ago, 22, 23. Papa Sai. Right. Papa Sai. Yes, big, exactly. big, big, big one. And again, I guess somebody like a Papa Sai, he could understand your plight, even though he didn't make it in that realm where you were, but you guys no, were but he, he in actually the same was, place. He was massive and he was... Um, Papa Sam, what a lot of people don't understand, you know, you would be like, Papa Sam would come in like the equivalent of like what Rakim did for hip hop. Got you. Got so you say what well, Rakim now, remember everybody rhymes were like simple, A, B, C. What Rakim mm -hmm. did is like, it's been a long time since I left you without a doubt beat the step two. You know what I mean? And, and it's like, him they just intricate, make, made it intricate. That's what Papa Sam did for dancehall. Mm -hmm. In fact, who I would say learned from Papa Son and took his style and basically built upon it was Vibes Cartel. You understand? Yeah, once you put it that way, you're 100% right. It's just now he fast forwarded 20 years after the fact, say, hmm, this is how his style would sound in like a 2000 or yeah, 2005 but, but, or whenever he came. What you have, to, you have to look at it is that it was even, even more innovative than Cartel at the time because mm -hmm. at least with. With Cartel now, he had something to look back on to take it from. Yeah. True. With Papa San, he didn't have anything to look on. Yeah. He just he just just out of sheer talent and just started like spitting and just freestyle and you know what I mean? So yeah. he he got it with me because he's actually from the same world. So Yeah. Yeah, no nah, man. And 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 he has a song out right now where it's like even even people that is not into Christian music. You have to check it out. It's a song named Lessons. I didn't produce it, but it's, okay. it's just good. Okay, good. So then, okay, so then now you're on this new path that's more fulfilling. You know what I mean? Where you more feel fulfilling, better. More, more positive. Um, and honestly, I, I don't know where, where God going to lead me to next. You know what I mean? And it's just, I'm just making my spirit guide me yeah. versus me trying to guide myself <laughs> hey, hey, no, and that makes sense because again why i like speaking to somebody like you it's like you went into the we'll call it the belly of the beast which is the entertainment at the peak of the peak of the peak mm -hmm. worked with people at the peak and it still wasn't fulfilling the money came in the notoriety the work and everything and that still wasn't fulfilling so you're a living testament well, of Really, because when they say money doesn't buy happiness, no, it doesn't. Money, money don't make you happy. It's, it's, it's literally you have to make yourself happy. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that. Like a lot of people have this stigma about Christianity, like, like them don't want God to them prosper. Like, mm -hmm. no, that's 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 absolutely not the truth. You have a lot of people that are God fearing people that are rich, mm -hmm. but 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 they don't put. Basically, with, with a lot of this world in, in this industry and music industry in a whole is that a lot of people um, put value on money over everything else. No, you should yeah. put God before everything else. And basically, their money becomes their God, which also is a form of idolatry, mm -hmm. which now they start to worship the money. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's, that's, that's where all type of, that's where everything goes wrong. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Then you fall into the, the sins of the world. And then, you know what, after that, see it and have you. And, and honestly, I did not want that for my life. So no matter how foolish I may look to the world, mm -hmm. I don't even care because I'm not living for people. No, and it doesn't matter because if you follow the world, you probably wouldn't have turned out to be the super producer, build a super sound, do all of this stuff that you've done 
each step of your life right now. So it's not about what people are saying, it's about what you feel in your heart. And again, remember for a long time, you were not feeling happy and at the, and you're at the peak of your career and you're not happy, but no. something has to change. I, I would say I would have a, a little sense of happiness, but it was, it was, it was just more of like, uh, uh, like a, a bandaid over the wound. And then once, when, when something gets thrown off, no, then the bandaid come off and then the wound get bigger yeah. because the problem initially just was never fixed. Yeah. So which was you know, yourself, like, which was what's going on in yourself, exactly, and right. and, and 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 it's just about living, mm-hmm. living more positive, living um, more for love versus more what we can get out of a person, and and not not to think less of myself, but to think of myself less. So you. Just, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just be a good person overall. Be more giving. Mm-hmm. Be more. Just, just, just be humble. Do you know what I mean? Like, no, I am not better than you. You are not better than me. Mm-hmm. Nobody's better than no one. Not because you have more money with your accomplishments. It don't matter anymore. Like to me, that doesn't matter. Yeah. And, but a lot of people are so caught up in this lie with, with all these sins. It's like, it's like they're all right. Like I said, why most people would get, gain a lot of weight because the bad food tastes better. It, yeah, you're right. It really does. But but if you want to live a longer, healthier life, mm-hmm. um, be healthy, it, it, it's a lot more dedication and it's a lot more like it's a lot more responsibility, so to speak. And a lot of people are not are unwilling to accept those responsibilities. So they rather to deal with the temptation and the loss of the world, which is the 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 loss the, like, you know, looking at them woman and, and the things that are so wrong now. Well, wrong from ever since yeah. is now so commonplace um, on TV and social media and all of that stuff. And it's like all of them are burning with this lust, this temptation, the fornication, the, just all the evils of the world. And, and honestly, y- you cannot have these negatives and expect positives from it. It's just not going to work. It just don't. It don't, mm-hmm. they, don't they don't mix. If somebody is dealing with those sins and those lusts and tell you that they're happy they're lying to you mm-hmm. because i've been there done that that's why i wanted to talk to you because i knew if anybody could explain it we're not just talking if i told somebody hey money's not going to bring you happiness i'm not believable because okay yeah you made a couple of dollars here a couple of dollars here but you weren't that person there for them to really listen say hey pal money does not bring you happiness you got to be happy before you got that money to amplify whatever happiness you had before because bringing it now is only going to amplify your misery or make you buy more things that you think is going to make you happy just and you're not going to be happy again well because it's like you buy those things say say you will buy these things or even with women or whatsoever you're just constantly doing things trying to chase this happiness that's never going to come because you yourself is not fixed yeah you know what I mean? And and I, I really, it's just, you remember, like I told you from early on in my career to, to, to me seeing all these evils of like what popularity, fame and money brought. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when Black China just blew up now and got big. I just remembered just being sad. Okay. And I'm like, yo, this, this is it. Yeah. This is it. This is. The, I had more fun building it yeah. than where I'm at right now, and it's like trust the no, process, bro. Trust yeah, the process. I, I just felt sad, yo. Like, what did you expect it? Are what did you expect it to be, or there was no expectation? Well, well, what what everybody that's broke expect it to be is like, oh yes, cool. I'm broke. Um, and when they have an experience, they think money will fix all these issues for them. It fixed some issues financially. For sure. But but if you're not responsible, you're going to end up back in those same situations. Be like, even somebody that had got money from before and lost it, it better them never made it because they, they actually would have been happier. Because now they lost it, they'd be even sadder. They, them were, because they had it once and then no them don't have it anymore. And no them they're on a Next level of unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're unhappy that you lost it, and you're unhappy in the first place. Yes, you're exactly. And it just unhappy. and then it just keeps adding, 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 yeah. adding, adding, and that's why you see so much people mm-hmm. either commit suicide or them end up on drugs or because they're running away from something. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, 
just just all these people that you said live these kind of sinful lives they're running away from something man yeah i hear you so 2020 right now we're in the middle of pandemic and all of those stuff there what's next for super dopes right now whatever god tells me to do honestly because um and this is not something that people put out there on social media and they probably might have heard it but we are we are in end times right now sure. we whether you believe it or not we are in end times um basically jesus explained like the the end times as like somebody with birth pains which is somebody in labor which it mm -hmm. it starts slow and then it, it starts to continuously build and get faster so Basically, from the 20th century, we had like the wars, them like World War One. Then you had the this this massive pandemic that killed 50 million people. Over 50 million people was called the Spanish flu. Then you had World War Two. Then you had all type of war, rumors of war, yeah, pestilence. And then it, you're talking two times happening. But if you really look at it right now, it's happening more frequent. For sure. So you have earthquake in diverse places. You're talking about rumors of war. This is Matthew 24 I'm talking about mm -hmm. um, in the Bible, New Testament. Then you have um, you have the plagues. Right now, this coronavirus is pestilence. I believe that this should pass, yeah. but there's something coming right after that. You have earthquakes in places that earthquakes don't hit. Yep. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, there Wasn't there an earthquake in Toronto like a few years ago? Yeah, yeah, we got. I remember sitting exactly where I am right now. I remember sitting here and feeling the earthquake. It's like I looked at my other way. Yeah, I'm not crazy, right? No, I'm, I'm people, and, and, and Toronto is a place that never normally get earthquakes. Then you have earthquakes like in Utah. The other day, earthquake hit Jamaica in January. Seven point seven um, hit. It wasn't directly over Jamaica, but it was. It was like between Cuba, mm -hmm. Cayman, Jamaica, and then it was even felt in Miami. Then you have earthquake in California the other day. Yeah. And then you have these wildfires, the ones that was burning down Amazon the other day. Then you had the wildfires that was burning down Australia. Then you had the the plague, the plague like um, with the with the locusts in Somalia. Yeah. In Africa. Right? Billions oh, yeah. in Africa. And, and and these are just things that is showing you that the second coming is near. So I'm not going to lie to you. And and this is something that I have to be bold with. Okay. Um, because this is me now, and I'm just I'm just giving y'all a warning. Like this is this is it. This is my reality right now. So whether you listen to me or not, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if you don't, if you don't believe, ask God. Yeah. You see, the trick with it is this: you're just here as a messenger. Mm -hmm. Whoever picks up and believes the message, that's on them. Your job is just to deliver the message. If if one person that watched this. Mm -hmm get this message that I said at this end part here, then I've done my job. Yeah, you get it. So regardless of what people feel, think whatsoever, I don't care mm -hmm. because I don't live for people. I live for Christ. Yeah, I get it. Oops. This conversation has been nothing short of amazing. And let <laughs> me even, even before that, and let me even give you another testament of how when you become success, successful in your field, it's not necessarily you that change. It's sometimes the people around you that change. Yes. When it came to, when I started doing the interviews and stuff about two years ago, I said, yeah, man, Dopes, Dopes is my friend. I know Dopes for a long time, but I know since Dopes is on this level, OVO, producer for Drake, Rihanna and stuff, uh, I'm not sure how to approach him because now that he's here, is he still the same person? Now, do I have to act different? Do I, how do you act? And again, then now that's me changing my way of acting towards you and you yes. might just be the same person say hey look muscle link me hey what's good i haven't spoken to you for a long time but I i'm say, overthinking it uh, yes you are you are overthinking it but but the thing is i wouldn't say I change much but yes i did change okay um and i changed based on how people used to deal with me and then i kind of had my guard up for sure you know what i mean so it, it a lot of times i would it would be easy for people for me to let people in my life because they they let me down a lot you know what i mean so yes i just had this guard up like yeah or it, it was some time ish um just just a bunch of damn things man <laughs> <laughs> you've had a lot you have had and you still have a lot going on in your life and again as you said a lot of people are pulling you from different directions i don't know if you're real i don't know if you're genuine so here what no everybody just leave me alone 
Exactly. But yeah. but as of right now, with this new space that I'm in, it's just I, I treat everybody accordingly. Mm-hmm. I want to treat people and do <clears throat> the the how I want somebody to treat me is how I'm going to treat others, regardless if it's reciprocated or not. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's just overall just being a good person. Mm-hmm. I, I believe that I've always have been a good person, but I was just hurt for many years. No, that hurt is basically almost serious now. I wouldn't say that I still don't have any. Mm-hmm. But most of it is gone. Yeah. Um and I know I can say for the first time in my life that I truly know what peace feels like. And that's the peace I got from God. So Amazing. Amazing story, brother. Brother, you don't know how happy I am for you. From my seeing you at the top of the mountain till I see you right now, it's just an amazing journey and, to see. And this is the first time I ever did an interview like this. Yeah. So you're the first one, Muscle. Thank you, Dopes. Thank you. I don't know if I'll do any more, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> but again, it comes back to the first thing I said when we came on. It's the relationship, and it's even bigger than relationships. It was the spirit just said, you know what? Reach out to Dopes. And I was shocked when you reached back to me so quickly. It's like, Dope. And you knew who I was right away. I said, you know what? It was just time. You know what I mean? Yes. It was just uh, well, right now. well, how we met and how I remembered was from a very bad start. Mm-hmm. But the fact is that I remember you and then we met again and it's good. Yeah. Dope. You know what amazing. I mean? Leave some contact info so they could check out check out you on your journey. They could see what you have coming up or anything. Leave some well, contact well, info. Well, just um, check me out on my, on my Instagram at superdubs. I think the, the, the thing is right here. <laughs> <laughs> I got to hold it on my camera, yeah. So, yeah, it's right um, here. And yeah, at superdubs at Instagram. You can Google me and stuff like that. Um, I don't really like brag about what is coming out or whatsoever because honestly i don't even know right now and yeah. and honestly i think i was watching i think that's a friend sent me earlier that dr trace like man i don't know what's wrong with these people nowadays just posting up this and that like it kind of like devalue thing just make 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 it have a mystique about it yeah surprise them surprise them yeah so yeah. so right. just you never know what's coming and I'll just surprise you. <laughs> any big ups, any shout outs, anything you want to say before um, we leave right here? It's just my family, um, all the people them that were in my life um, that helped me on this journey, the, the people them that were true to me, the genius, Mr. Morgan Latoya, Cardinal Official. Um, honestly, it's, it's just a lot of people still that that never walked away from me and that were dear for me. Mm-hmm. Um, big them up, big up my wife, of course, my kids, um, and the Almighty, the big boss, the big boss, him, him uh, first, him first. Yeah, dope's a great conversation. I know it's not going to be just one; it's going to be a lot of people that's going to really see the inspiration and understand, and hopefully walk in the footsteps. Yeah, man, absolutely. Well, yo, God bless muscle. Mm-hmm. Dopes, it's been great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Muscle, and this has been another Two Line Music Cuts Entertainment Report podcast, and we are out. This podcast is brought to you by www.twolinedmusicut.com.